So hello, today is, I'm looking at the time now, I was going to say December 10th, but it's really November 3rd, and we are here today to talk about total shoulder replacement. Actually, a lot of people, and especially as we age, we start suffering from that bothersome shoulder pain, and sometimes we don't know what to do about it, there might be treatments for it, and there is also surgery. A lot of people might be scared of surgery, but you don't have to be, not anymore. And this is why we have Dr. Jordan Simon with us today to explain about this condition and surgery and all of that. This is your opportunity to ask all the questions that you have to a doctor that is an expert on the topic. So please use the Q&A or the chat box to interact with us and send us all of your questions. I'm going to be reading your questions loud to Dr. Simon to get you the answers you're looking for. Without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Jordan Simon. Um, Dr. Simon, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. 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 Uh -oh. Sure. 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 This is echoing. 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 Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, and now it's not echoing. Good. All right, just had to turn it off on my computer. And... All right, so uh, I'm Dr. Jordan Simon, uh, the director of the Total Joint Replacement Center at Nyack Hospital and Montefiore Nyack Hospital. Um, I went to medical school at uh, NYU and did my training at Hospital for Joint Disease, where I developed an interest in total shoulder replacement and joint replacement in general. And for the past 21 years, I've been in uh, practice here in Rockland County, initially at Orangetown Orthopedics, then it became Northeast Orthopedics, and now we are part of the Montefiore Einstein Orthopedic Department. Um, we routinely perform uh, shoulder replacements at Montefiore Nyack, and I'm happy to say that uh, patients are uh, very satisfied with, with their results. So I, I thank Sandra for inviting me to talk about uh, shoulder replacement today because I think it's a topic that uh, a lot of people, they hear that we do shoulder replacements, but they're not really sure what, what shoulder replacement is. Um, hip and knee replacement are much more common. And I think that that's, uh, you know, what leads to a little mystery around shoulder replacement. So um, before you talk about replacing a joint, you have to understand the anatomy of the joint. And basically the shoulder is a ball and socket joint. The socket, however, is very shallow. And if you see on this, on this picture here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, um, but basically the, the ball and socket are in this area here. The socket is very shallow, allowing the ball to kind of glide up and down. It's not really contained like a hip, like a hip socket is. And that's why the soft tissues are very important, specifically the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is a group of four tendons that wraps around the ball of the, of the shoulder bone and holds the ball in the socket. Um, and that's very important when it comes to shoulder replacement because we still need to be able to hold that ball in the socket. Um, basically, when somebody has shoulder pain, it can be coming from the soft tissues, it can be coming from the bone, it be, can be coming from the ball and socket joint, otherwise known as the glenohumeral joint, or it can be from the, um, the other parts of the shoulder, such as the AC joint or rotator cuff. Um, this is a picture of the rotator cuff. Again, it's four tendons. Um, when these are disrupted, it can cause pain. So not every problem in the shoulder is the rotator cuff. Not every problem in the shoulder is the joint. This is a picture of a normal shoulder. And as we can see, there's a space between the ball and the socket. And that space is very symmetric. There are no big bone spurs. There's no, uh, there's no bone on bone here. This is what we want a shoulder to look like. If we see a shoulder like this that hurts, chances are it is not arthritis, it's not the ball and socket, but it's likely to be the rotator cuff or something external to the shoulder joint itself. Uh, MRIs are very helpful in diagnosis of shoulder problems. Um, we can see the soft tissues as well as the bone. When somebody has arthritis that's going to require shoulder replacement, an MRI is useful to look at the soft tissues because that's going to determine details of the surgery. But we can usually diagnose arthritis based on an x-ray. This is an x-ray of a patient with osteoarthritis. 
And what you can see here, the difference between this and the other picture is there's no space between the ball and the socket. This is what we call bone on bone. And down here, which again, I hope you can see, there's a big bone spur underneath here. We call that a humeral neck osteophyte. And that tightens up the soft tissue and blocks the motion of the shoulder. So this is a patient who would come in saying their shoulder hurts um, and they're having difficulty moving their arm. Um, and we would initially treat this conservatively with physical therapy, um, oral medications such as Advil, Aleve, Motrin, Tylenol. We might do an injection of cortisone into the joint itself. We may even offer the patient arthroscopic surgery to go in and try to clean things up a little bit and buy more time, especially in younger patients. Um, and then in, in patients who have failed those conservative managements, total shoulder replacement is an option. Um, and again, conservative management, rest, ice, medications, therapy, and injections. This is what a shoulder replacement component looks like. Starting from the left, we have basically three, three different, four different components. We have what's called the glenoid, which is the shoulder socket. And this is a piece of plastic that we apply to the shoulder socket. Uh, we don't remove the entire socket, we just resurface it. We try to remove as little bone as possible, and then we typically cement in this piece in order to create a nice smooth surface for the ball to ride on. Then next we have the ball, which is this shiny silver dome shaped piece. And that with the nice plastic socket will allow smooth gliding of the surfaces. Next in this particular case, this is called the replicator plate. And this is just an adjustment piece that allows us to position the ball in relation to the, to the arm bone in such a way as to reproduce the native anatomy. Not everybody's shoulder is shaped the same way. So this particular brand, which is the one I use, it's called Exact Tech. They have this replicator plate, which allows us to move the shoulder, the shoulder uh, component up, down, in, out, tilt one way or the other, and we can match the anatomy so that we can fit it to the patient in a custom fashion. And then we have the stem. This goes in the humerus or upper arm bone. That bone is hollow. And we press fit this in place. The bone will actually grow into this portion here um, where we have a, a texture and that becomes part of your body. So what we end up with is we end up with what we see in the middle there. Oops, let me go back. We end up in the middle there where we have the ball on the stem and that goes into the arm bone. And uh, I, my shot slides are advancing on their own, not sure why. Uh, and then we have the socket on this side. And this is what a shoulder placement looks like. On the left, we see the pre-op x-ray where it's bone on bone with a, big, with a big bone spur underneath the neck. On the right is after the surgery, we've removed the bone spur and we've put those metal pieces in the upper arm or humerus bone. And then on the socket side, you can't see it, but the plastic piece is actually cemented in there you can see the little metal wire that we use as marker. So we've recreated the surface of the bone where we now have the smooth metal piece articulating on the smooth plastic piece. Okay. And um, that, that's typical of shoulder replacement. When we have arthritis, we do what's called an anatomic shoulder, okay? And by anatomic, we mean it matches what the patient had before. There are some patients who don't necessarily have arthritis, but they have um, a torn rotator cuff that can't be fixed. So this particular MRI is a patient who has a massive rotator cuff tear. The tendon is all the way on the right here, and there's no way we're gonna be able to stretch that tendon from the right side of the picture all the way to the left to repair it. This patient typically will not be able to lift their arm because their deltoid muscle is pulling the ball up, but the rotator cuff is not rotating it first. So this is a patient who we would try to treat again conservatively, maybe try to fix what we can with a partial repair, but really the fix for a chronic rotator cuff tear in somebody who has, uh, who has severe symptoms such as pain or inability to lift their arm, again, total shoulder replacement. Now, the total shoulder replacement we would do for that patient is a little different. In this slide on the top is a typical anatomic shoulder. Again, we have the replicator plate, we've got the ball, we've got the socket. Below that is what we call a reverse shoulder replacement. And as you can see, we've got a plate, we've got now a plastic socket, and then we have the metal ball, and then the piece that the ball attaches to that goes into the shoulder socket. So we've reversed it. 
we're putting a socket where the ball used to be and we're putting the ball where the socket used to be. That's called the reverse total shoulder replacement. And using that, we can fix a we can fix somebody's shoulder who has a torn rotator cuff. Picture on the left is a typical patient with an irreparable rotator cuff tear. The ball is sitting high in relation to the socket. We can see here, this is the bottom of the socket. The ball is sitting all the way up here. So we've got about an inch of superior elevation. The ball is hitting the bone on top. So when this patient tries to lift their arm, they can't get their arm up over their head because they're impinging. We do a reverse shoulder replacement, putting the ball where the socket used to be and the socket where the ball used to be. And now when the deltoid muscle tries to pull upwards, the arm bone is forced to rotate around the ball and that gets them back to being able to lift their arm up over their head because it forces the rotation. So if somebody needs a shoulder replacement but doesn't have a good rotator cuff, the reverse shoulder replacement allows us to do a successful operation. Um, and you know that's actually a relatively new thing probably in the last 10 or so years. We've actually gotten to a point where we do more reverse shoulder replacements than we do anatomic shoulder replacements. And the reason for that is the rotator cuff is the failure point on most shoulder replacements. I can do a re replacement in somebody at 75 years old and they can do really well. Three years later, their rotator cuff becomes thin and fragile and it tears. Now they've got a shoulder replacement that doesn't function very well because they don't have a functioning rotator cuff. So in any patient that has any compromise of the rotator cuff, we go right to the reverse shoulder replacement because it works very well. And we don't worry about the rotator cuff failing in the future because this will compensate for it. So I would say I probably do about four reverse shoulder replacements for every one anatomic at this point. Um, in younger patients, we still try to do the anatomic shoulder because we can always convert that later to the reverse. But in patients, especially over the age of 75, we, we tend to be more, um, more generous about going right to the reverse. And that leads to, to better long-term outcomes because we don't have to worry about the rotator cuff as much. Either way, whether we do a standard shoulder replacement or a reverse shoulder replacement, both of these operations will relieve pain, restore function, and they do have a, a very good track record in terms of, of longevity. And you know, that's, that's my formal presentation. Um, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that come up. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Simon. I love the, the graphs and the explanation. It really made, made it very clear for me. Actually, my mom had uh, surgery for the shoulder and mm -hmm. you know very little did I know exactly what happened now I feel like okay I know what she's thinking that she's the bionic woman now um mm -hmm. it's all the metal and all of that so let me ask you something about those pieces that you were showing there um what type of metal is that like is that something that is going to stay with you for the rest of your life you don't have to worry about it yeah so the the metal parts are typically made of titanium Okay, on the, the parts that go into the bone of titanium, the ball part, the shiny ball part is cobalt chrome because it's a bit harder than the titanium and that way it lasts longer. Um, bone loves titanium. And anytime you're trying to get the bone to grow into or onto a surface, titanium is the metal to use. The part that goes into the, into the shoulder socket is also titanium and that way it really um, incorporates nicely. These are permanent implants. We do not plan on removing them. If, if we're removing them, it's because something went wrong. Either it's infection or some type of failure. Um, but typically we put these in and they're in for life. Mm -hmm. Who is eligible for the surgery? So we tend to try to treat younger patients conservatively. And we kind of look at the older age group as, as the ideal candidate for these uh, implants. But but I've done shoulder replacements in people as young as 50, 52 years old. Um, typically, these are patients who have had pain for a long time. They failed conservative management. Again, injections, physical therapy, activity modification, um, and their x-rays or, and or MRIs show severe glenohumeral joint arthritis. The key to shoulder replacement is you're working on replacing the ball and socket. So that's where the pathology is going to be. The other indication is somebody who has a failed rotator cuff repair or an irreparable uh, tear. 
And for instance, yesterday I had a gentleman who he had a little bit of arthritis in his shoulder, but his main problem was he had a massive rotator cuff tear. We had repaired it previously. It, it, it failed. We did, it did not heal. And he's 71 years old. We decided, you know, instead of trying to repair it again, the first repair is the best repair. So we decided we'll do a reverse shoulder replacement and that will give him his function back. And even this morning, he's already doing better than he was before the surgery, because especially with the reverse shoulder replacement, patients recover very quickly. Mm -hmm. Are there any people who should not have the surgery? That is um, contraindicated? <laughs> Certainly some, you know, somebody who has an infection should never have something put in. If they have an active infection, they should not be having metal and plastic put in their shoulder. Um, other than that, there's no major contraindication. You, you have to have the right, you know, the right prerequisites, meaning there has to be enough bone to work with. You have to have at least a functioning deltoid muscle. Um, and you have to be generally of good health to undergo an operation. But typically, shoulder replacements are done in patients in their 70s, 80s, and even 90s. So, you know, it, you'd have to be pretty sick or have massive bone loss in order to not be a candidate for, for a shoulder replacement. Mm -hmm. uh, November is diabetes month. So I have to ask a question about diabetes. So if you have what people call bad diabetes, when your A1C is very high, your diabetes is out of control. Would you need to wait or is it okay to have this surgery? So anytime we do a major operation, such as a hip replacement, knee replacement, or shoulder replacement, <clears throat> we want patients to be in optimal health. That doesn't mean perfect health. Somebody who has diabetes, they're, they're obviously not perfect, but it's controllable condition. <coughs> Excuse me. So if somebody's diabetic and their hemoglobin A1C is 10, we're not going to do the surgery. Because we know that with some focused medical care, we can get that A1C down below seven. And at that point, it's safer to proceed. Risk of infection is much higher in somebody with a higher A1C. So that's a modifiable factor. If they can't get their diabetes you know, down low enough, then they might want to you know, reconsider who's treating them. Because I, I've seen some pretty sick patients. We've optimized them medically. And then they're much better off, you know, later on getting surgery. This is this is rarely, if ever, an emergency. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the pre and the post of surgery? Is there anything that we need to know to do or know to prep for the surgery and then afterwards? So most of these patients, you know, have had extensive treatment before surgery. They've been through physical, you know, they've, they've had injections, they've had physical therapy. Um, so as far as pre-surgery goes, it's really a matter of we encourage them to continue with their home exercise program to, stre to strengthen their muscles and, and essentially be in the best shape they can be for the surgery. Um, and then we want them to optimize their, their health. We want them to see their medical doctor, make sure their diabetes is under control, their hypertension is under control, make sure they don't have any active cardiac or pulmonary issues. Um, after surgery, everything depends on which surgery we did. If we do a reverse shoulder replacement, we're not worried about the rotator cuff. We're not worried about healing of any tendons. The only thing we want is for the, for the um, inflammation from surgery to calm down. So those patients will typically wear a sling for about two weeks for comfort, and we let them start moving their arm as they're comfortable. And usually by two weeks, patients are taking off the sling. Um, about 10 minutes ago, before this call, I just saw a patient that I did a reverse shoulder replacement on two weeks ago. Before surgery, he could lift his arm about this high. He's now two weeks, and he just lifted his arm this high with no therapy. Wow. And that's what we see with the reverses, which is, again, why we tend to favor doing those because they make a rapid recovery. Um, pain, is, pain is not that bad afterwards. And, you know, by six weeks, he's going to have full motion above his head. There is, with reverses, there is a restriction reaching behind your back. It tends to be kind of tight. So I always warn patients, don't expect to reach behind your back normally, mm -hmm. but you'll be able to reach over your head. You'll be able to reach out in front of you. And that's, these patients you typically can't do that pre-op, so that's a big difference. For the anatomic shoulders, because the rotator cuff is so important to the outcome, we have to go a little slower on the therapy. 
when we do the approach to the shoulder, we're opening up through the rotator cuff in the front. The tendon is called the subscapularis tendon. And when we cut that tendon, we do our work and then we repair that tendon. We have to let that tendon heal. If that tendon doesn't heal, the results of the surgery are not going to be nearly as good as if it does heal. So typically those patients will wear the sling for about four weeks. We'll go very slow with their motion. And then after four weeks, we start speeding things up in terms of motion. And usually by six weeks, we're out of the sling completely. By three months, we're starting to work with light weights. But the recovery on a reverse shoulder replacement is going to be faster than the anatomic. But the anatomic being that it's more like a regular shoulder, you know, may perform a little bit better in terms of reaching behind your back, strength, things like that. But typically, it's two different populations. Younger patients, we're going to try the anatomic. Older patients, we're going to lean more towards the reverse. And, and the recovery, as I said, is a little bit different between the two. And who has the last word as to which surgery is best for you? Would that be you as the doctor or would that be the patient? That would be me as the doctor. Um, you know, I will discuss ahead of time. Let's say somebody's 65 years old. I'm going to get an MRI before surgery. I'm going to look at the condition of the rotator cuff. And if it looks perfect, I'll say, all right, we're going to do an anatomic. I always have the reverse in there as a bailout in case I'm doing the surgery and the rotator cuff tears while I'm operating because we are retracting the rotator cuff. It is, it's in the way. And there are times where the rotator cuff looks good on MRI. And as we're working on the shoulder, it starts peeling off the bone. Huh. And then you say, well, do I want to repair it or do I want to just take it out of the equation and do a reverse? That decision is made during surgery. Thankfully, it's rare because most of my patients, I know what I'm going to do beforehand and I stick to plan A. But the plan B in an anatomic shoulder is to go, is to go, out, go back to the reverse. Um, I would say the vast majority of times, I will tell a patient, your rotator cuff is not in as good condition as I'd like. We're going to go right to the reverse. But in some cases, yeah, the, you know, we're planning on an anatomic. And then during the operation, we notice the rotator cuff just isn't as healthy as we thought, and we'll, we'll bail out to the reverse there. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's rare. Mo most patients, if, I, if I've gotten an MRI and I've reviewed it with them ahead of time, I'm going to know whether an anatomic is the right operation or we're just going to go right to the reverse. Mm -hmm. And I think we touched on this already, but we have a question here. How long after a shoulder replacement can you move again normally? Um, so it's very variable. Typically with a reverse shoulder replacement, the patient was not moving normally ahead of time. So again, getting back to my patient from a few minutes ago, before surgery, he had about 30 degrees of forward elevation. He's two weeks now, and he's already got a hundred degrees of forward elevation. He's probably going to get to about 140 degrees, which most people would consider normal. And that's going to take about six weeks. If we're talking about an anatomic shoulder replacement, I don't want the patient to try to move their shoulder normally for quite a while because I want the, the subscapularis to heal. And typically I'll keep them in the sling, as I said, four to six weeks. At six weeks, they'll typically be up to about 100 degrees of forward elevation. And then by three months, they're going to be up around 120, 130. It may take four to six months for them to get that full range. And I, I've seen that time and again where a patient starts out very slow, their shoulders stiff. And we just keep at it. And, you know, six months later, then they're, they're at the point where they're happy. Um, so this is all, this is all these questions and the answers are why in the older patients, we tend to lean more towards the reverse these days, because it is a quicker recover. It's an easier recovery. And we don't have the concern about a failed rotator cuff. Younger patients, we tend to go a little bit slower with the recovery, but I think that the longevity of the anatomic favors that in the younger patient. Here is another question that we just got. Patient with failed ORIF, multiple fracture proximal humerus with rotator cuff damage and multiple tendon tears, would the reverse be a good option for this patient? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the reverse shoulder replacement, the only thing you need for a successful reverse is a working deltoid and no infection. And, the, and then the bone stock on the glenoid side or the socket side. I actually had a patient exa in exactly that situation who um, he had had a fracture. 
it he basically he didn't heal properly he didn't have an orif but it didn't heal properly um he tore his rotator cuff um we tried to do a rotator cuff repair and fix the bones um didn't work and then i went on and i did what's called a tumor prosthesis where i took off the whole top of the humerus and cemented in a um a very large humeral section and then put the glenosphere ball on the socket and he did fantastic um i mean he moved his arm like nothing had ever happened um so it definitely can be done in that situation but the biggest concern is with a multiply in, uh, multiply operated shoulder you have to make sure there's no infection because if you've had a plate and screws put in and it's failed and somebody's gone in and tried to fix it the risk of infection is there but once you've ruled out infection as long as the deltoid is working um a reverse would work there now dr simon why are people scared of this surgery um you'd have to ask them <laughs> i don't know i don't know um all joking aside i i think that you know hip replacement and knee replacement have a very long positive track record shoulder replacement it's not done very often there aren't it's it I, I wouldn't call it a routine operation for most surgeons you know there are surgeons out there who will do one two shoulder replacements a year huh. that's not going to lead to great outcomes because they're just not getting the experience so you know from that people have gotten a poor taste in their mouth and historically before we had the reverse shoulder replacement you really needed an intact rotator cuff. And if you did a shoulder replacement and the rotator cuff wasn't in good condition to begin with, or if it failed, you had a poor outcome. Uh -huh. So up, in, up until we had the reverse shoulder replacement, you know, there was a lot of variability in, in, in the results. With the reverse as an option, we have, we're able to treat people with and without rotator cuff pathology. And I think that that's led to better outcomes. And I think that just in time, we've learned more about how to do a successful shoulder replacement so from history yes people know somebody who had a shoulder replacement and they didn't have a good result but i think as time goes on there are more people having positive experiences and i think that we're we're getting to a point where shoulder replacement is is becoming more mainstream and is physical therapy needed after each surgery so i would say Again, splitting into two categories. With my reverse shoulder replacements, I definitely have patients who do not ever go to physical therapy. I show them exercises to do, and they do them, and they gradually get better. Um, and that's roughly half. The other half want the guidance of the therapist. With an anatomic, absolutely, because we're going slow with their recovery. We want to restrict the amount of motion they're doing early on to let that subscapularis heal. And we want to do a progression, which is which is best supervised by a physical therapist. Once everything is healed, they're gonna work with the physical therapist, but they're also gonna do exercises at home to reinforce what they're doing in therapy. Um, so therapy is very important with the anatomic shoulders, less important with the reverse, but still helpful in, in some of the cases. If there is something people don't like to take is painkillers. And I know that a lot of people before they get to the surgery, they probably have been in many many different uh, painkillers do they still need to be taking the painkillers after the surgery so immediately after surgery depending on patient's pain tolerance we usually will use some narcotic pain medicine i i i don't give people painkillers before surgery for this because to me if you need percocet for your shoulder pain uh -huh. then medication isn't the answer we probably should be doing some type of an operation um and you know if you give Percocet to somebody for something that's not going to get better and you're going to keep them on it long term, there's addiction issues. So I really avoid narcotics in patients for arthritis. Uh, Postoperatively, the expectation is the pain is going to go away. So we use narcotic pain medication to control pain in the immediate post-op period. But most of these patients with the shoulder replacement, they get off the narcotic pretty quickly. Some of them will use it before each therapy session just to take the edge off and allow them to get you know a, a better basically to get more out of the therapy because if they're in too much pain the therapist isn't going to be able to stretch as much um, but typically i don't refill the medication much for these patients most of them will get off the narcotic within a few weeks 
and they'll start using, you know, ibuprofen or, or another anti-inflammatory for their pain control. And the goal is, is that, you know, within six weeks, they're going to have so little pain, if at all, that they won't need any pain medicine whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that a lot of people here are wondering, how do I get to Dr. Simon? And what can we do to go to Montefiornaya and see this in reality? Um, so where, where can we go? All right. So personally, I work out of our Orangeburg and our Pomona offices. Um, we have other offices in the county. And there are, I do have partners who also perform shoulder replacements. Um, our website is uh, neosmteam.com. Northeast Orthopedic Sports Medicine, N-E-O-S-M, the word team, T-E-A-M dot com. And our phone numbers are there with our locations. And it also has a little blurb on, um, on what each doctor does. Um, there are about three or four of us who do shoulder replacement on a regular basis. Um, each one of us has a little bit different style, may use a different brand. But those of us that do shoulder replacement are, are doing enough of them that, you know, that we're having good outcomes. Um, and then my phone number for my office is 845-359-1877. Again, that's, that's on the website. Excellent. So I put it in the chat for everybody to mm -hmm. copy that. Thank and, you. Um, Dr. Simon, you keep insisting, and I think it's a very valid point, that people go to a doctor that has experience and that has done many of these surgeries and knows what he or she is doing. Mm -hmm. So how many surgeries do you think, you know, that would be a question that I ask now to a doctor, like how many of these surgeries have you done to feel comfortable uh, going to this doctor? Yeah, so, you know, everybody is, everybody is a little different in terms of what their comfort level is. I think that, you know, if somebody is performing, um, you know, 10, 20 shoulder replacements a year, that would be the minimum. You know, you don't have to do these every day. Most patients that walk into my office with osteoarthritis shoulder don't want surgery, and I'm not going to convince them to have it. Um, so I, I definitely treat more patients conservatively, but when they reach that point where they want surgery, I'm very comfortable doing it. I could probably double my volume if I told patients you need surgery. I don't. I, I say, look, when you're ready, you'll know. You let me know. Um, but typically, you know, I in 20 years, um, I probably have performed over three to 400 shoulder replacements. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with it. Um, I would say if, you, if, if somebody tells you they do one or two a year, that's probably not the person you want to use. You know, you do want them doing them um, on a fairly regular basis. Um, hip replacement, knee replacement, much more common. Um, but the shoulder placements, again, if somebody's doing, you know, them a few a month, that's, that's kind of the average. Um, there are a few doctors at tertiary care facilities who will be doing three or four a week. Um, those doctors are focusing, you know, on shoulders. And typically, they don't want to see a patient until they've been told, you need a shoulder replacement. Um, and then after surgery, if there's any problem, they don't want to hear from you because they've done your surgery, they've moved on. Um, so I'm, I don't think you need to go to somebody who's, you know, who only does shoulder replacement, but you should certainly go to somebody who does it on a fairly regular basis, you know. And a, a few per month is, is reasonable. Mm -hmm. And why wait, right? I mean, you're in pain. And if you know that eventually you're going to get there, then why, why to wait for the well, surgery? I would say there's actually good reason to wait. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if I could guarantee a perfect result on every surgery, I would tell patients, oh, you're in pain, just do the surgery. Mm -hmm. The fact is there are potential complications. And... You have to consider that in your decision making. If if you have an if you have a shoulder that you can't lift the arm, that you can't sleep through the night, that you're taking pain medicine, and you've tried all of the different things that can make your shoulder feel comfortable, and you're still unhappy, that patient is ready for surgery. And God forbid they don't have a perfect result. They're going to be happy just having relief from the severe symptoms they have. If you have somebody who has mild symptoms, but they have arthritis and they haven't tried all of the conservative measures, if that person has a complication or just an imperfect result, they're going to turn around and they're going to say, why did I do this? I don't understand. It's no better than it was. What happened? What went wrong? They're going to be very upset. Mm. So 
I actually am more conservative and I do try to have patients hold off reasonably. Now, if somebody's 85 years old, they've been suffering it with it for years um, and they have poor function, I, I will encourage them to take the step and, and go with the surgery. But if somebody has good range of motion, their pain is managed with oral medication, they're not waking up in the middle of the night, even if with a bad x-ray, I'm going to tell that patient, hold off a bit, you know, God forbid things aren't perfect. You're not going to be happy. Let's make sure that you're making the, the, the decision to proceed for the right reason. So yes, it is inevitable for, for many patients, but I've also had patients who we've treated conservatively and they've never gone on to have the shoulder replacement and that was the right thing for them. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's important for every patient to have a discussion with their, with their surgeon and make sure that they're at the, at the proper time in their life and that the symptoms warrant, you know, this type of intervention. Is there any um, age limit for the surgery? Nope. I've done, I've done shoulder replacements in patients in their 90s. Haven't done, any, haven't done anybody over, over 99. Uh, uh -huh. But I think that, you know, if somebody is in good health and they have the appropriate bone stock, and their deltoid muscle is functioning and their symptoms warrant it, I don't, I don't have an age cutoff where I would refuse a patient. Um, and I think that for, for whatever reason, the patients in their late eighties and early nineties, they do amazingly well with, with this operation, especially the reverse. Um, so I, I don't have any age restriction. Yo on the younger side, yes. If somebody comes in, they're 40 years old, I really don't wanna do a shoulder replacement on that patient. There are some limited approach shoulder replacements that are available to those patients. But if you start doing shoulder replacement at an early age, those patients are, those patients are really gonna have a tough time 30, 40 years down the road, you know? So we don't wanna do it too early if we can avoid it. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any other questions and I think that this is, this has been very, very helpful, and I hope that it helps a lot of our attendees and a lot of people out there who are going to see the recording. So I don't know if you have any last thoughts, Dr. Simon. Um, no, I, I just think that, you know, if somebody's having shoulder pain and they have arthritis in their shoulder, please, you know, see one of our surgeons where, you know, it doesn't mean you're getting surgery. It means we're going to do a proper evaluation. We're going to do everything we can to try to avoid the surgery for you. And then when the time comes to have surgery, you know, you can rest assured that you'll, you'll be better than you were before and you'll likely be very happy. Mm -hmm. And no pain. That's, that's the goal. That is that's the, goal. the yes. goal. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Simon, for being with us today. I know you're always super busy, so thank you for making the time. And thank you to our attendees for joining us today. We have a lot of events this month. It's Diabetes Month, so we're going to be talking about a lot of things. So please check out our calendar at montefiornaya.org events calendar because we have everything for everyone. Also, next week on Saturday, we are, you can meet Dr. Simon in person, right? I think you're going to be there or someone from your team at our Montefiore Nyack Health Fair in the Nyack Public Library. So join us there. We have tons of gifts to give away, tons of information. Invite your family, your friends. Let's make the most out of that day. Thank you so much, Dr. Simon. And thank you to everyone out there at home. See you later. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thanks.